The critics say that to resist Pope Francis is to behave like a Protestant. But what about this then? It was a big deal when she tore up this picture of Pope John Paul on live TV, but what happened a week later on SNL was even bigger. YouTube celebrity priest Father Mike Schmitz praises mass facing away from the people, and Greenpeace co-founder blasts net zero as a threat to humanity. Finally, Putin bans transgender surgery, and Catholic Spain rises again. Don't tell me we can't win this war. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Matt, and this is the Remnant Underground. It is summertime, friends. We've got a news flash. It's hot outside. Time for the climate Nazis to make their case. July is set to be the hottest month on record in possibly 120,000 years. That's a long time. So evidently now, 120,000 years ago, somebody was checking the temperature. What are they using, like rocks, coconuts? Running down the numbers, down the numbers yeah, and, and possibly 120. They're not sure, 120, 125,000 years, somewhere back there. It was as hot as it is now. You know what? Because the, 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 uh, up here in Minnesota, the uh, highway asphalt is buckling. It's so hot, right? And this just doesn't happen. So I don't know why I remember 20 years ago driving down 35E heading north and suddenly finding myself going airborne because my car had hit a buckled piece of asphalt when it was really hot 20 years ago. Must be my imagination. Maybe just like summer is hot? Summer is hot. I think that's, at, at the end of the day, that's, that's the main thing. Summer is hot. So I'm really not sure what they're talking about. But of course, it's been a little warm. So it's an opportunity to scare us with climate change. You know, it's that time of the year. And I don't know what they're going to do if we simply don't care. Because at the end of the day, whether it was 120,000 years ago or whatever, I actually don't care. And I truly, truly hope none of you care either. Because the less we care, the less power they have over us. And they're getting away with doing something now. They're going into agriculture and threatening to cut off the supply of food because food is causing global warming. In order to get net zero, we'd have, first off, we'd have to kill all the animals, including ourselves. It's all completely phony. And so is the campaign against CO2, completely phony. There's nothing to it. It's not a real thing. Trust the science, morons. Elsewhere in the news, I'm looking at the movies now, I see that Barbie, Barbie is doing pretty well at the box office. You seen that yet, Walt? No, I mean, we, you know, who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Yeah, we're not going to review that. We're not even going to get scandalized and horrified by that, because why? Well, if you walk into an outhouse, you don't usually complain about the stench, right? And that's kind of what's going on with these Hollywood movies, every single one of them. I can't imagine why anybody's still going to any of these. We're not going to review it. We're not going to freak out over it. Elsewhere, some sad news, I guess. Sinead O'Connor has gone to her eternal rest. Now, she was the Irish pop singer who just, I guess, just a couple of years after I was out of college, uh, she gained international notoriety when she tore up a photo of Pope John Paul II on Saturday Night Live in 1992. Now, of course, she was born and raised Catholic in Ireland. Uh, she said that it was out of protest. She was protesting the child sex abuse among the, you know, the clergy in the Catholic Church. She didn't have a point. She, no, never mind. I don't, I don't know. I don't. And the thing is, interesting thing, and that's about all I want to talk about as far as that particular news story, is the fallout. Oh, my gosh. I mean, criticizing the Pope in 1992 was something you simply did not do. And that was pretty much the end of her, her mainstream career. After that, she wandered around. I think she became a Muslim for a while. I think she returned to some sort of Christianity, and then she was eventually ordained as a Latin Tridentine priestess who offered the Latin Mass. I kid you not. Poor troubled soul. May God have mercy on her. But what I really wanted to talk about with respect to this story, everybody else is covering, you know, the death of Sinead O'Connor. I guess she was about 56 years old. But what was interesting, what's interesting to me is what happened the following week on Saturday Night Live, just a week later. I don't know, some of you might remember this. There was an incident on the show last week. Sinead O'Connor tore up a picture of the Pope. And I thought that was wrong. So I asked somebody to paste it back together. 
So we have that picture? Yeah. I think that's a lot better, thank you. But I'll tell you one thing, she was very lucky it wasn't my show. Because if it was my show, I would have gave her such a smack. A guy as popular as Joe Pesci was at that point, that he thinks nothing of walking out on Saturday Night Live set in front of God and everybody, in front of an international audience, and proudly defending that he's a Catholic, he's an Italian, and that he's defending the Pope. That's, that's kind of an amazing thing. Uh, a lot has changed. 25 years later, for example, uh, Ricky Gervais uh, has suggested that both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis are pedophiles. Look, talking of all you perverts, it was a big year. It was a big year for pedophile movies. Um, surviving R. Kelly, Leaving Neverland, Two Popes. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. I don't care. I don't care. You know, and, and he was invited back. Far from what happened to Sinead O'Connor, she was, she was like exiled after what she did to the Pope. Victory of good over evil. Fight the real enemy. Now let's just think about that. This was only 13 years after Pope John Paul made this, his famous trip to the Phoenix Stadium in Ireland. He became the first pope. He was the first pope to visit Ireland at all. It was a, a massive event that they said would per, you know, permanently change uh, Ireland for the better, that would, would, would inspire Ireland, would save the faith, would strengthen the faith in Ireland, right? 2.7 million Irish Catholics came out for that historic event. This was September of 1979. Some of that's on the screen right now. Now, what did it mean? What, what, what happened because of that? 26 years later, 26 years after this, Ireland legalized same-sex marriage. <laughs> 29 years after this, Ireland legalized the slaughter of the unborn, abortion. I think it was shortly after that that they elected a prime minister who was a married homosexual, if I remember correctly. Yes. Ireland yes. literally fallen into the sea. What happened to the faith in Ireland? You know, what was it all about then? What, they were talking about the great glorious reign of Pope John Paul, and I don't mean to run him down, but what happened after other than everything got exponentially worse? <laughs> Today, less than 30% of Catholics in Ireland attend Mass on a weekly basis. Sunday Mass, obligatory Mass, which they all grew up learning, I would think, was a mortal sin to skip Mass on Sunday. The Mass, 91% in 1975, 98% in 1969, we're still going to Mass in Ireland. That's almost 100% of Irish Catholics. The percentage of Catholics in Ireland is now just above 70%, but falling. The average age of a priest in Ireland is now 70. What in thunder happened? Now here, for example, is uh, the Catholic Church in San Francisco today, present time. I'm going to show you something from a few years ago. The first, San, San Francisco Catholic Church today. Check it out. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And with your spirit. My name is Donald Godfrey and... For the few who are here, but also the many who are watching live streaming, welcome to St. Ignatius, St. Agnes Parish. As we celebrate a virtual pride in San Francisco, today's gospel reading is a keen reminder that everybody stands equally before the table of the Lord. All are welcome, whether rich or poor, black or white, straight or LGBTQ+, divorced or single, all are welcome here. Now that's today, 60 years after Vatican II. Here's San Francisco in 1961, just a couple of months before Vatican II. The whirring sound of the helicopter breaks through the air and whips the waters of Spreckles Lake as it lands, bringing to us our very special guests. Father Peyton, Auxiliary Bishop Donahue, Bishop Guilfoyle, Mayor George Christopher, and California's Governor Brown. They are greeted by the crowds of people 
and escorted by our city officials and the guard of honor. The choir has greeted our dignitaries with the Ece Sacerdos. They and we are here united for one purpose, homage to a gentle Virgin Mary through the rosary. Father Peyton's hand is raised in blessing and greeting in answer to the eager outstretched hands waving below. A sea of human souls, a throng estimated at well over half a million. Indeed, one of the largest religious gatherings ever assembled in North America. That's the governor, the mayor, all the church people, right? The hierarchical figures. Half a million people coming out to join Father Peyton in saying the rosary <laughs> a few months before Vatican II. Pardon my French, but what the hell happened? <laughs> How did we go from that to what's going on in San Francisco today? The Holy Rosary is the most powerful weapon. The day of my patent is spotless, a feeling the Spirit of Sancti Vicente Super Voice of Mani at Semper. Praise be Jesus Christ. So I think there are still, what, a few seats left. We're still trying to sell the last few seats. I'm going to be emceeing that entire three-day event. Uh, so we're going to have plenty of time to get to know each other and shake hands and talk about, you know, uniting the clans all over the world. Uh, the theme for the Catholic Identity for the CIC is going to be revolution, or it is revolution, counter-revolution, turning persecution into victory. So we're going to go over a lot of things. Uh, one of the speakers that we have, in fact, is Mark Huck, who's the pro-life warrior who was famously arrested by the FBI and beat them in court. Can't wait to hear his keynote address on Friday night. Uh, really pleased to, be, to welcome uh, Vatican journalist Edward Penton. It's a huge deal. And get this, we will be interviewing now, this is, you're hearing it here first, at the Catholic Identity Conference this year, we will be interviewing Cardinal Gerhard Muller. According to the law of God himself, the first commandment, um, idealism is a grave sin, mm -hmm. and not to mix them with the Christian liturgy. Uh, and this can, to put it out, throw it out, can be against human law, but to bring the idols into the church was a grave sin, was a crime against the divine law. <laughs> Former head of the, head of the CDF, uh, one of the top theologians in the Catholic Church today still, he'll be at the Synod, uh, and he is the courageous shepherd, those of you who are not Catholic, he's the courageous shepherd who, in, in my opinion, uh, delivered one of the most courageous statements any shepherd has delivered in the past 50 years when on the Raymond Royal show, he said this. Yeah, if, if they will succeed, but that will be the end of the Catholic Church, and we must resist. I just want that, want that to sink in just a little bit. Cardinal Muller is going to be addressing the Catholic Identity Conference. God is good, friends. This is going to be huge, as they say. Now, the conference sold out last year. I'm pretty sure it's going to sell out again this year, especially now. So sign up today at catholicidentityconference.com or .org, either way, or just go ahead and scan this QR code right now with your phone. It sent you right to the registration page, and we can get you signed up for this year. We still have a few seats left, and that's for the Catholic Identity Conference 2023. We'll see you there. We've talked about this again and again with respect to uh, His Eminence Cardinal Muller. Uh, in a sense, letting us all off the hook when he publicly said, we must resist, right? We talked about that. Uh, he said, because if, they, if we don't, that they are going to destroy the church. We must resist. So we're going to talk a little bit about this idea that resistance in and of itself is bad. It makes you like Martin Luther. It's really a bad thing. Now remember, this is, we've gone over this before as well. Resist coming from the Latin to hold up, to cause something to stand, right? I know if we were saying to Francis, we were saying, we're going to resist you until you stand for the faith again. You see, that's the whole point. 
Uh, and this is not what Martin Luther was doing. Martin Luther, what did he do? He, <laughs> he nixed four out of seven sacraments. He had theological problems with the Catholic Church's teaching, with the infallible teachings of the church. Utterly, you know, this is apples and oranges. But nevertheless, we get this accusation now and then. Just yesterday, some, uh, somebody sent me a clip of a lady on YouTube uh, in a show. She was a guest on a program, and she all of a sudden just starts uh, proclaiming that Michael Matt is a Protestant because he criticizes Pope Francis. <laughs> she likes Latin Mass, she says. And of course, she doesn't agree with everything Francis is doing. They have these little caveats. You ever notice this? They're going to you know, have, try to establish a little trad cred now before they go after us. I don't even know it's why, but they just do. Uh, don't agree with Francis on everything, you know, but, but what, what Michael Matt is doing on his show, well, that's just, dang it, that's Protestant. Mm, I'm indignant. <laughs> now, this woman, she's adorable, you know. I'm not going to embarrass her by naming her. I think that would be childish. I just want to use her as an example of the neo-Catholic thing that still residually exists, that criticism that still exists out there, even though you have the likes of Cardinal Muller saying, we need to resist, guys, there's a problem in the church. Uh, and so the problem with this critic, as with most of our neo-Catholic critics these days, and there are not many left, most are moving towards traditionalism. Did you hear that Father Mike Schmitz, for example, is now calling for ad orientum at the Novus Ordo Mass? It makes sense that we would show up and watch. Why? Because the way we've organized the sanctuary. Right, so, so what happens is the priest is here behind the altar. You're looking at the priest, and he's like the talk show host. He's at the altar. Remember, this is the altar where they pour the blood of the lamb of the sacrifice, Right. But he's kind of standing there at that thing, and we just kind of watch him like this. It's called Mass, I think, Pro Popolo, something like that. To the priest, ad, whatever, to the people, ad, whatever, I don't know Latin. Um, I skipped that year, I was sick that day. <laughs> we used to have Mass, what they call Ad Orientum, which means to the east. And that's when you hear some people saying, oh, that was when the priest turned his back to the people. Sure, if you want to look at it that way. It's got a little secret prayers. Don't look. Nobody. Or it could be. Or it could be this. The ministerial priest is leading the kingdom priests up the mountain of God. <laughs> Everybody's like kind of moving away from that, you know, that Novus Ordo thing that's obviously gone, gone really wrong. Good for Father Schmitz. I'm very pleased. I'm not mocking you at all, Father. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, but, the, but a lot of these critics, I think what the problem is, is that they're afraid that traditionalists might be right, like this woman I'm talking about. And, you know, what happens to them if, if we are right? I sort of, I sympathize. It is a problem, isn't it? Because some of them have very cushy positions in universities and colleges, and they don't resent that at all, you know, or some of them are well-financed professional Catholics, you know, apologetists or apologist guys, you know, on, on YouTube or on TV, whatever, on the radio. And that's all going to come to an end if they actually come right out and say what the traditionalists have been saying for 50 years. You know, they've been infiltrated. The church is in, in, in serious trouble and it starts right at the top. The fish rots at the head. It starts right at the top, and it has for an awful long time, not just with Francis. So what do they do? They bury their heads in the sand, and the best they can do is try to disqualify us. Mm, those traditionalists, man, they're, they're in schism. They're Protestants. They're bad because they don't want to face it. They don't want to face their own lack of intestinal fortitude to go ahead and say, just, you know, admit the obvious. Something's really going wrong. So they call us Protestants. <laughs> and that, by the way, is the only time they ever say anything pejorative about Protestants, because that's, that's something of the pre-council thing, too. That's too rigid. You don't rip on Protestants anymore. Uh, but it's okay when you're talking about traditional Catholics. You guys are Protestants, man! But the thing is, if I'm a Protestant, friends, and my little lady critic, maybe you should listen up here, if I truly am like a Protestant, uh, I think Francis would be thrilled with that. You see, you've got to remember that Francis is the, is the Pope who issued a Vatican official stamp celebrating the Protestant revolt, celebrating Martin Luther. There he is up on the screen. Do you remember this? Francis went to Lund, Sweden, to personally commemorate the, the Protestant revolt. So there he is, hanging out with uh, guys, guys and gals dressed up like, like bishops. 
even wrapping one of them up, this lady, this lady archbishop, wrapping her up in a great big papal bear hug. I'm Antje Jacqueline, I'm the Archbishop of the Church of Sweden. Okay, um, what does this mean to you, that Catholics and uh, Lutheran are getting together? Uh, oh, this is a wonderful day uh, that we finally, after 500 years, for the first time ever, can jointly commemorate the Reformation together on a global level. That has never happened before. Ten days before that, Francis unveiled his favorite statue of Martin Luther, yes indeed, right there inside the Vatican. Pope Francis met with a group of some 500 Lutherans from Germany on Monday as part of an ecumenical pilgrimage called Better Together. The statue of Martin Luther, erected for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, appeared once again on the stage of the Vatican's Paul VI Hall. So, if Michael Matt is behaving like a Protestant, I don't see why that would be a problem for Francis, to tell you the truth. But the thing is, as all of this is going on with Francis and Luther and commemorating the Protestant revolt, everything that, that is actually in Francis's purview, everything to do with the Catholic Church, with Catholic countries, with the, you know, with the, with the common good of a couple of billion Catholics, all of it's going to hell, right? He doesn't seem to be doing anything about that. He's listening, he's worried about climate change, but he's not really doing anything about the fact that formerly Catholic countries, not even that formerly Catholic, we went to Malta after the Sharp pilgrimage, we took a pilgrimage there. Divorce was, this was just a few years ago, 10 years ago? Divorce was still illegal, yeah, abortion was still illegal, remember? And it's just been going downhill so fast under Francis to, to the point now where in Malta, Catholic Malta, which remember saved Europe once before, we had kind of hoped it might save Europe once again today, but now they're putting people in jail for defending scripture and God's law on sexuality. Uh, last year, I was invited to uh, share my story on a program and answer questions about so-called conversion practices. And um, I mentioned an organization as well that supports men and women who leave LGBT and an organization that promotes uh, biblical sexuality. And um, it, three people reported me to the police in Malta claiming that I was uh, breaching chapter five, six, seven of Maltese law, which says you cannot advertise so-called conversion practices. I exercise my right to be silent and uh, the, the police press charges against me. If I'm found guilty, I could uh, spend five months in jail or I could um, you know, pay a fine of up to 5,000 euros in Malta just, just for really exercising my freedom to be a Christian. Think that's going to stay in Europe? Huh? It's going to come here. It's going to affect every single one of us if we don't get serious about standing up to what's happening in Rome in the Vatican right now. Because I'm sure Francis is looking at that guy, the poor guy in Malta, and he's going to jump in and defend him, right? Let's actually let's check in and see what Francis is saying about that. Per favore, rinnovo il mio appello ai responsabili delle nazioni, perché si faccia qualcosa. Wait a minute, wait a minute, stop the tape. Let's just play a little game, shall we? What do you think Francis is about to say? What do, what do you think Francis is about to call upon the leaders of the nations to do? <laughs> so he's going to call on leaders of the nations to do something. What, what, what is he calling on them to do? Do you suppose it's stopping abortion? Maybe calling for an end to the castration of the world's children? Maybe he's going to call for that they, that they stop jailing defenders of Holy Scripture in Malta. Maybe. Let's check and see what he, what he did call for. Limitare le emissioni inquinanti. È una sfida urgente e non si può rimandare. Here you go, Francis. And by the way, Al Gore sends his love. Emissions are still going up. All these promises of the last few years to cut emissions, emissions are still going up. So what, what do these guys really want? that in the face of so much turmoil, economic collapse, world war, bur burgeoning world war, you know, trafficking of children, poverty, whatever, worldwide global problems, what do they really want? Cockadoodle Cami came right out with it this week. Think about the impact on something like public health. When we invest in clean energy and electric vehicles and reduce population, reduce population, reduce population, more of our children can breathe clean air and drink clean water. 
So all we have to do is reduce the population, get rid of some kids, and then we can all be happy. <laughs> These people have commissioned themselves to save the planet, the biggest morons in, in the world today. They're going to save the, the planet, and we're supposed to go along with it first. It was their wars, then COVID, then their jabs, and now it's climate terror. The oceans are boiling. <laughs> Trust the science, morons. All of this, while well, they're also telling us that we should really be afraid of public enemy number one, Vladimir Putin, who continues to terrorize the planet with moves like this. Here he is. Last week, Putin signed a bill that bans sex reassignment surgeries and medical interventions associated with transitioning in Russia. <laughs> the evil, bad, scary, horrible monster Putin said he is seriously concerned. And they asked him why he's doing this. He said because he's seriously concerned about what he calls the, quote, Western transgender industry, which has promoted an increased number of gender reassignment surgeries here in the States by 50 times over the 10 years, Putin, over the past 10 years. He calls this a, a, a path leading to the degradation of any nation. And he says that Russia doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Thursday, October 21st, claimed that it is monstrous that Western children are taught that they can change their gender. Speaking in Sochi, Putin said it is close to a crime against humanity. Uh, was he wrong? Here's the thing, friends. We've, we've gone over this Russia-Ukraine thing for a long time. Ukraine is obviously losing this war as we knew, we knew they would. The only reason they're still hanging in there is because of the senile fool Joe Biden and his friends at Davos, his globalist friends, are propping this little Zelensky guy up. Everybody knows that. That's what's happening. I think they're worried right now Zelensky is going to cut a deal with Putin if this goes on much longer. I mean, and that's an entirely realistic possibility in my opinion. But in any case, if you still think this is all about, you know, saving Ukraine and, and all of that, if you're afraid of Russia, I would recommend that you stop supporting uh, war with Russia and Ukraine, Biden's war. Because right now, let's face it, the U.S., just like Ukraine, <laughs> is no match for Russia on any level. You know, think about it. We are in a moral and spiritual freefall in this country. Well, Russia seems to be recalling the very stuff for which, historically speaking, people have always been willing to die. We've shown you this. These, there's, a, there's a lot of propaganda films coming out now uh, showing us what the notion is, what, what Putin has as, as an ideal for Russia that he thinks is going to work. I think we showed you this one last year, but I want to point something out. Take, take a look at this, uh, at this film. Now, we showed this when we first when we first weighed in on the Ukraine thing, and I, I think we've been fully vindicated. I'm not going to rub it in people's face, but obviously there are very few serious people who thinks we should, think at this point that we should be supporting uh, Biden's Biden's run up to World War III now with Russia. But if you look at that, I mean, you caught that, right? This is a, probably a propaganda film, right, that Putin is responsible for. And how does it start out? Sviaty Boja, Sviaty Kripki, Sviaty Besmertny. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, sung by a beautiful young Russian lady. Now this comes straight from the Russian Orthodox liturgy. <laughs> I need you, to, need you to ask yourself, why would that be? How could that be? A serious problem for us here in the states that they're using the, the equivalent almost of the of the Kyrie in the Latin rite to promote Russia. Can you imagine them doing that here in the United States of America? And I know what some of you are going to say, "Yeah, well, that's Russian propaganda, man. Stop falling for it." Okay, fine. It probably is. Looks like propaganda to me, straight out. But here's the question: propaganda for whom? <laughs> Who's this appealing to? Who's this seducing? Americans? Are you kidding me? We don't identify with that anymore. 
We don't identify with holy God, holy immortal one. <laughs> we don't have any idea what that even is. This is America. This is the story of a soldier who operates your nation's Patriot Missile Defense Systems. Begins in California with a little girl raised by two moms. Eventually standing at the altar to marry my other mom. With such powerful role models, I finished high school at the top of my class. And after meeting with an army recruiter, I found it. I'm U.S. Army Corporal Emma Malone Lord, and I answered my calling. So I would ask you again, why is Putin putting out propaganda films like this? Meant to seduce whom? Because the thing is, the almost unavoidable conclusion is that this type of film, of propaganda film, if you want to call it that, which involves God, country, and family, this indicates that these ideas of God, family, and country are worth dying for again according to 144 million Russians. Do you see what I'm saying? In the long haul out of the dark gulag that that country has been through, they're moving in the direction of Christ, Christianity, family, and borders, country, right? And so I would say, I would say you can't avoid the fact that what they're pushing, what Putin is pushing in Russia are ideals that we believe in, ideals that will make Russia stronger than any other country on the face of the earth. And that could be seen as pretty terrifying for us, right? Biden is trying to provoke Russia into a world war that we can't possibly win on any level. Any level. We're going to lose it if that happens because we're too morally and spiritually, psychologically sick to fight a war right now. And our neocon leaders are coming apart at the scenes. They're literally leave, losing it. They're refusing to step down. They're just completely obsessed with war now, the neocons, the war hawks, like Mitch here. And a string of uh, Somebody, you know, get, get, help him to retire. Why, what, what are we doing here? It's like abuse of the elderly on so many levels in our country right now. And while that's happening in the state, our spiritual leaders in the church are obsessed with climate change. Si stanno sperimentando qui in molti paesi eventi climatici estremi. We gotta resist this, friends. And this isn't the end of the world. It's happened before. We need to stop babying ourselves so much. <laughs> the Catholic Church is an institution I am bound to hold divine, writes the great Hilaire Belloc. But for unbelievers, a proof of its divinity might be found in the fact that no merely human institution conducted with such knavish imbecility would have lasted a fortnight. Says, says Hilaire Belloc. You see, we're going back for a long time. Like we always say, it's a, the church is divine. The church is human. The human has been the human element of the church has been populated by lunatics in the past, and that's what's happening right now. Francis is orchestrating knavish imbecility such as the world has never seen, and you don't have to be a traditional Catholic to see what's going on. Um, and we need to uh, look no further than the late Cardinal Pell, who said that his uh, pontificate had been uh, catastrophic. Um, and uh, this synodal process, this synod and synodality, which is going to take place uh, in October, um, it, Cardinal Pell called it a toxic nightmare uh, couched in neo-Marxist language. But this doesn't change what you and I believe. <laughs> Everybody's freaking out over this synod on synodality where they're going to listen. But you know what, friends? Here's the thing. As we go into this, my priest just said this the other day. Such a great priest, diocesan priest. 
He says that, you know what, at the Senate, they can say whatever they want. They can say whatever they want. <laughs> it's not going to change what we believe. They can say that we all must worship the great thumb God, that everybody should be gay and gay marriage is fine and ladies should be priests. And it's not going to change what we know to be the reality, what we know to be true. We know the doctrine, the defined infallible teachings of the church, and we know that the church has been infiltrated. So it doesn't really matter, does it? We have to stand up and fight them, fight what's going on, resist them. And I keep saying it's not a matter of, of uh, being more Catholic than the Pope, although that's certainly, what, that's certainly the case for most of us now. But it's not a case of being belligerent. It's a case of loving the church enough to go out and take a stand for her at a terrible, dark moment that she's going through. She's given us everything, including what and who we are. <laughs> and again, we resist to save our souls and so that we can do our primary duty in this life, which is to hand down the faith of our fathers to our sons, to our daughters. That's it. And friends, this is happening all over the world. But he says, I'm too, I'm, too, I'm too optimistic. Well, that's because I just keep seeing things happening everywhere, all over the world, and this, on this side of the Atlantic and on the other, that indicate that the future is ours. I take our, our friends over in Spain right now, a good priest friend of mine, uh, sent, sent, me, sent me this clip. They have established the pilgrimage of Our Lady of Christendom. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because we've been doing the Sharp pilgrimage for 30 years, which is called Notre Dame de Clétienté, Our Lady of Christendom in French. You see? So this is an offshoot in Spain. It's an offshoot of the Sharp pilgrimage in France. So this year I saw some of the, some of the Spanish guys were walking with, our, with our, the, the leaders of Notre Dame de Clétienté uh, so they can see how it's done. They're learning the ropes because they're taking that pilgrimage and they're bringing it into, into Spain right now. So I met with them doing that. It was, it was good to meet them. And what you're looking at now are the pilgrims at the final mass. What you're hearing is the Adoro Te Devote, composed by St. Thomas Aquinas 800 years ago. It's being sung by young people during the distribution of Holy Communion. They're all receiving it on the tongue, as you can see. Some 1,200, 1,500 of them, Spanish traditionalists, the vast majority of which are young, young families, children, young people, you see? listening, hearing the Mass, celebrated according to the traditional Roman rite, which dates back to apostolic times. And this is after Traditionus Custodis, the attempted crackdown on Latin Mass. Friends, this is just the beginning over there in Spain. It's another major Latin Mass pilgrimage is springing up and, it, and, and, and happening right now in Europe, and there are going to be more. This one in Spain gets bigger and bigger every year. As we said, the one in France this year was 20,000 strong. In other words, the Catholic faith is rising up from the ashes of this modernist revolution that we thought was invincible not very long ago. And it seems, it appears, that there's nothing anybody can do. No human being can do anything to stop this. People say you're wildly optimistic. Really? Am I? Did I mention that at this year's Catholic Identity Conference in Pittsburgh, we're going to have speaking to us two bishops, one archbishop, and a cardinal of the Catholic Church? Let me ask you, did, did, did you ever see that coming? I didn't, but God obviously did. And we've come a long way from the basement chapels that I knew when I was a kid. And that's simply from hanging on to the old faith, not being intimidated, not giving up on it, refusing to be bullied into abandoning the faith. And we've been saying this for a long time. Wait, anticipate the good bishops. A lot of them are going to start waking up. Many of them are going to start waking up. Some of them already are. Some of them are literally standing with us. So it's time for us to make good on that, that, that promise that I've said down here so many times. Your excellencies, your eminences, stand up, lead us, and you will find in us, traditional Catholics, the best defenders, your best defenders in the world today. We're with you. Just lead us. <laughs> because there's a war to be fought and we need to fight it. So please friends, don't tell me we can't win this war. We're winning it already just by keeping the faith today so that our children will be able to take back the buildings tomorrow. That's the way it's gonna work, why? Because Christus vincit.